Today we're going to look at a nice problem that I found in a 1999 issue of Math Magazine. And so the solution to this problem involves lots of nice techniques that are good to keep in mind. So let's see what we want to do. So our goal is to show that this number is not a perfect square. And notice this is a double sum. And it's a finite sum. So we've got the sum as n goes from 1 to 1998 of the sum as m goes from 1 to n of m to the 1998 and then 1997 to the n minus 1. So notice the inside of this is a power sum and I guess there is a closed formula for large power sums like this but it's kind of difficult to work with. So, you know, maybe we need some sort of other strategy. Notice that the outside bit involves a geometric series. So it's a finite geometric series, but there is a formula for the sum of a finite geometric series. So that gives us some motivation to perhaps change the order of summation so that we can do that inside geometric series first. So let's do that. So I'm just going to bring this up here and just put a magenta box here to say, well, that's our number. So just pretend that we've got all of that written in there. And now, like I said, we're going to change the order of summation. But in order to do that, let's lay out graphically what's going on here. So here I've got like a horizontal and a vertical axis. Let's say our vertical axis is the M axis and the horizontal axis is the N axis. So observe that we're going from N1 to 1998. So let's put some values of N here. So here we have 1, here we have 2, here we have 3, then way out here we have 1998. Okay, so the first value of N is... Uh, 1 obviously and that's associated with an m value of 1 as well but notice that m can go from 1 up to n so if n is equal to 1 m cannot be larger than 1 now let's move on to n equals 2 so here we'll have this is n equals 2 and then we're allowed to have m equals 1 and m equals 2 there because we can go up to whatever the value of m is we're at Okay, so now let's look at n equals 3, and we're allowed to have m equal to 1, 2, or 3 here. Now I think you can probably see what's going on. So notice if we're way down here at n equals 1998, then we're allowed to have any m value between 1 and 1998. So let's just put it like that. So obviously there's going to be a lot of stuff in the middle there. So observe that what we're getting there is a triangle. And in fact, that gives us some motivation for how we can change the order of summation. So notice that if we wanted to put the n values on the n side, then the smallest that n could be, remember that when you're talking about a horizontal variable, smallest is to the left and largest is to the right, the smallest n can be is m. So we'll put an m as the lower bound and then the upper bound will be 1998. And then similarly, we'll have m going from one to 1998 as the outer bound of summation. Okay, great. So now let's rewrite our sum with everything switched in order. So we've got our sum as m goes from 1 to 1998. And then inside of that, we have our sum as n goes from m to 1998. And then we'll have 1997 to the n minus 1. And then outside of all of that, we'll have m to the 1998. Okay, great. So Observe that we most definitely have a geometric series going on inside. That being said, it's not set up in a way that there's a maybe a well-known or a standard summation formula because we have this starting not at zero, not at one, but this starting at a variable of m. So what I'd like to do here 
is perhaps re-index. I think that'll help us out. So let's re-index this to shift it down so it starts at one. So that means we're gonna need to replace n with what? n plus m minus one. So is that gonna make it all work? Well, notice when regular n is equal to m, our re-index will have n plus m minus one equal to m, which is the same thing as having n equal to one. Okay, so that's our lower bound of summation change. And then for our upper bound of summation change, when n plus m minus 1 is 1998, then we have n equal to, well, that's going to be 1999 minus m. Okay, good. So let's see how that works out for us. So now we'll have our outer sum, which is the sum as m goes from 1 to 1998. Now we'll have the sum as n goes from 1 up to 1999 minus m. Remember, that's our new upper bound. And now we'll have 1997 raised to what power? Well, it's not going to be n minus 1. It's going to be n plus m minus 2. So n plus m minus 2. And then outside of that, we'll have an m to the 9, 1998. And then next up, what we'll do is we'll factor some of the powers of 1997 out of this in order to leave a 1997 to the n minus 1, which is a more standard way of seeing a geometric series. So let's do that. So now we'll have our sum as m goes from 1 to 1998, and then maybe we'll factor a 1997 to the m minus one out. And then that leaves us a sum as n goes from one to 1999 minus m of 1997 raised to the n minus one. And then we have an m to the 1998 on the outside. Okay, good. And now let's maybe just go ahead and recall what we have here for our geometric series formula. So if we have 1 plus r plus r squared ending at r to the k minus 1, then that's going to sum to r to the k minus 1 over r minus 1. So that's just a standard formula for the sum of a finite geometric series. And so that's the situation that we have over here in this bit that I'm overlining in yellow. So let's see, that means that we can write this bit that I'm now underlining in yellow as follows. So it's gonna be 1997 raised to the 1999 minus M and then minus one over, well, our common ratio minus one, which is 1996. Okay, so that's looking good. Let's see where we can take it from there. Okay, so this is where we left off. And I think just like jumping out of the board screaming at us is the fact that we can take this 1997 to the M minus one and distribute it back in here. And that will at least make that first term a little simpler. So let's do that. And then maybe simultaneously, I'm going to bring a 1 over 1996 out front. So I've got my sum as m goes from 1 to 1998. And then let's see, I'm going to be left with what's left over here. It'll be 1997 to the 1998. So that's from that first bit. And then minus 1997 raised to the m minus 1. And this is all multiplied into m to the 1998. Okay, that's looking really good. Now, how are we gonna simplify this? Well, we're gonna pick a prime, a small prime, and reduce modulo that prime. And well, how do we make the choice as to which prime we're gonna use for our reduction? Well, we look at all of these numbers that are involved, and see like which prime will allow us to reduce these to all things that are very, very nice to work with. And what you'll see is that reduction mod seven works. 
So let's look at all of these things reduced mod 7. So 1996 is congruent to 1 mod 7. So you can check that 1995 is a multiple of 7. I believe it's 285 times 7. So that means that 1997 is congruent to 2 mod 7. And then, well, let's see, that's everything involved so far. But recall by Fermat's theorem, which is going to be something that we're also going to need, if we have a prime P that does not divide an integer A, then that means that A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo P. Well, that's like the situation that we have going on right here for sure. Notice that 1996 is congruent to 0 mod 6. This line right here between these two green lines basically tells us that if we're reducing the base modulo a prime, we reduce the exponent modulo 1 less than that prime. So, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that essentially what we have here, mod 7, is 2 to the 0, which is congruent to 1 mod 7. And then, well, just to like take care of the rest of this, this bit right here will be 1 mod 7. Well, it looks like 1 over 1, but, you know, when we have fractions modulo p, we generally think about these as the multiplicative inverses, but luckily we have a 1 there, so it's okay. Okay, and then, well, this bit right here will also simplify. It'll simplify to 2 to the m minus 1. And then, well, this last term over here is a bit of a wild card. And observe that it depends on whether or not it's a multiple of 7 because of this line right here. This only holds if p is not a divisor of a. So let's see. If 7 does not divide m, then this is congruent to 1 mod 7. Oh, I guess I should say here that's because this 1998, again, is a multiple of 6. But if 7 does divide m, then this is congruent to 0 mod 7, well, because it's a multiple of 7. So, well, we can take care of that just by putting a condition in our sum. So let's do that. So this is going to simplify down to the following. We'll have the sum as m goes from 1 to 1998 over all non-multiples of 7. So I'll just say that 7 does not divide m. And then we'll have 1 minus 2 to the m minus 1. Okay, great. But now we might as well take all of these 1s out of here. And, well, how many 1s do we have? Well, we have, well, essentially it's like 1998 minus something like the floor of 1998 divided by 7, all of the multiples of 7 between 1 and 1998. So how many is that? Well, it turns out to be a really nice number, the number of my birth year, which is 1713. So here we have 1713 minus our sum as m goes from 1 to 1998 over all non-multiples of 7 of now 2 to the m minus 1. And then uh, let's just write down, this is all occurring modulo 7. And then, well, we might as well reduce this 1713, my birth year again, mod 7 to make it simpler. And via easy calculation, division with remainder, you'll see that this is 5 mod 7. So we have 5 minus that sum. Okay, so let's see what we can do with that. So we just determined that our number is congruent to 5 minus this sum over all non-multiples of 7 mod 7. But dealing with those non-multiples of 7 is pretty tricky. So what we're going to do is add them back in. But if we add them back in, then we need to subtract them. But really, we're subtracting them out because there's a minus sign there. So that really means we need to add them back in. So let's now add in all of the values of m, which are multiples of 7. 
So there are 285 of those because you can easily check there are 285 multiples of seven between one and 1998. So we can write this as K going from one to 285. And then we'll have two and it won't be K minus one. It'll be seven times K minus one. Cause like, well, it's like having M being multiples of seven, but that means it's gonna be seven times something. Okay, great. But now we can actually simplify that a little bit over there, that seven or two to the seven K minus one, and we're gonna to wanna to do that. So notice that two to the seven K minus one is the same thing as uh, two to the seven raised to the K times two to the minus one. But by Fermat's little theorem, two to the seven is congruent to two mod seven. So that's gonna just turn this to two to the K times two to the minus one or two to the K minus one. So that's actually great news because that's much easier to work with. So let's just get rid of that and we can turn that into a K minus one. And now we're set up to use the, the sum formula for a finite geometric series. So all of this is gonna be congruent to five minus so we'll have two to the 1998 minus one, and then plus two to the 285 minus one. And like I said, this is all occurring mod seven. And notice I didn't really need to go over the common ratio of minus one because that is one in both cases. So we get a bit of easy simplification. Notice this minus one here cancels this minus one here, just because they're both attached to different signs. And then, well, let's write out some of the details here. So this is gonna be five minus two cubed raised to the 666 plus two cubed raised to the 95 mod seven. But check it out, two cubed is eight but eight is one mod seven, but then one to any power is one. So that makes this term congruent to one. And likewise, this other term will also be congruent to one, but they're attached to opposite signs. So that means our whole thing is congruent to five mod seven. Okay, but so what? Our thing is congruent to five mod seven. What does that do for us? Well, in fact, when you're reducing mod n, mod primes are most easy to work with. There are only certain residues that can be perfect squares. And in fact, five is not a perfect square mod seven. And we can check that like this. Let's look at this chart, a and a squared modulo seven. And what we'll see is that five is not on this chart. So let's go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So those are the only ones we need because those are all the different residues mod seven. So let's do zero squared. What's that? Well, it's zero. One squared is one, two squared is four. Three squared is nine. Well, let's see, nine is two more than seven. So that is two. And then let's see, four squared. Well, four squared is 16. Oh, but that's two more than 14. So that's two as well. And likewise, well, five squared is 25, but that's four more than 21, so that's four. Six squared is 36, that's one more than 35. But observe that in this list of squares mod seven, five is not on this list. So if our number is congruent to five mod seven, then it is impossible for it to be a perfect square. And that's a good place to stop.